that I have in my presentation, so you don't have to try to write them down. But of course, ARRL.org is where you can purchase some of the uh, materials. They have a book for each level, and uh, which came in very handy for me, because again, I do not have any electronics background at all. And so it explains the math, it explains um, all the principles of electronics and so forth. And the cool thing about these books is that they come with a CD, it has software that will uh, have, have practice exams, and you can set them up any way you want. If you want to just do a certain section of an exam or do a whole practice exam, there are different ways and it will track your scores and, and it's pretty cool. I have all three books up here, so if you want to take a look at them later, they will be up here. In addition, they do make changes to the questions from time to time. They will delete questions or um, there might be some other changes after the exam pool has been released. And so you, this is a great place to check for those changes. They also have some excellent resources to study. One of the areas that just confused the heck out of me was decibels. But they had a link to some material. It was like, oh, okay, now I get it. So there's lots of great materials. The metric system also just kills me. I, you know, I, I can't have trouble with that. But I got it because I got I got those extra materials. Another great resource that I've heard of, but I've uh, I've heard great things about, but I've never actually used these materials is Gordon West. He also has some books and audio CDs that are available, and I've heard that they're excellent. Uh, the no-nonsense study guides, uh, just for the tech in general uh, at that website. And then where I highly recommend are these two websites, qrdiv.com and the ehan.net. They have free practice exams and they are very good. And um, they, um, they have all the questions from the pool. They will keep track of your score. That way you can see when you're going from a 40 passing score to 100. <laughs> And um, so it's great to, a great way to track your progress. Also, there are lots of apps if you have a smartphone. I have uh, one on my iPhone right now for the extra. And uh, the main thing, though, to check is to make sure that not only it covers all of the elements, because some of the free apps will only cover like two, and they'll make you buy the app in order to get the rest of the, the rest of the group of questions, or make sure it has the current question pool. Um, and when you're taking these practice exams, they tell you that once you start making at least 85% or higher on a consistent basis, then you have a very good chance of passing the exam. So, um, to find out where they're offering the exam sessions, you can go to arr.l.org and uh, go to this website here. You put in your zip code, your city and state, or it, there's all kinds of parameters you can put in. and uh, it will give you a list of the available exams. And if you find one that you're interested in, like this one is for was for last night, August 23rd in Garland, you can click on learn more and it will tell you who to contact, where the exam is going to be given, and most every detail. I highly recommend that they do say that walk-ins are allowed for a lot of them, but it would be a good idea to contact them to find out do they only take cash for the fee or if they will take checks and any other requirements that they, anything that they need for you to bring to the exam. <coughs> also, if you'll check, if you're a member of a local radio club, uh, a lot of times they will have the uh, examiners available that can come and, and issue the test. Joe took his general at the Greenville Club right after the, the monthly meeting last month. So. so, some things to bring on exam day, you need to have some kind of photo ID and if you don't have a driver's license or your passport, you can go to the ARRL.org website or contact the examiner, the club that's doing the exams, and they can tell you what other accessible forms of ID. Um, for kids, they have some other things that, that they can do if it's a child. Um, bring your social security number or what's even better is to go to the FCC website and get a federal registration number. That way you will never have to use your social security number on a form when you take the test. And I'll show you in just a minute where, uh, where you can get that number. Um, 
They say to bring two number two pencils with erasers and a pen. When I took mine at Mesquite, they had everything, so I didn't really need, need any of that stuff. A calculator, you can bring a calculator if you want. Uh, all the formulas have to be erased. You cannot use any kind of smartphone or tablet. Um, and of course, you want to turn your cell phone off during the exam. And bring a check, a money order, or cash to cover the exam session fee. It should be $15 or less. If you contact the, the, the place that's giving the exam, they can tell you how much it's going to be. So to get your FRN, you go to this uh, FCC, the Universal Licensing System, and all you have to do is register, and they will give you uh, your FRN. A good idea would be to print that off and take it with you when you go to your exam so that you'll have it, because you'll have to have it on the paperwork. So on this website, you can not only um, register to get your FRN, but after you pass your exam, you're going to come here every hour of every day <laughs> waiting for your call. <laughs> <laughs> right? That's right. Okay. And it varies. Uh, it, it depends. It took uh, probably about four days before I got my call sign. It only took you, what, like? A day. A day? I took the test on Saturday, and by Monday afternoon, it was showing up in there. Yeah. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, it's a government agency, and they're pretty fast. <laughs> All right, so you pass. Now what? So, the, the, once you've passed, you want to think about upgrading your ticket, because that's what they call a license, is a ticket, can't speak. And uh, because when you get that higher level license, it opens up some additional hand bands, and Billy's going to talk about those in just a moment. You want to get on the air as fast as you can, and um, if you don't have a, a lot of money to spend right away, you can. there's lots of low-cost equipment that you can get, and Hugh and Eric are going to be talking about some of those. You should actually be able to get your license and a radio for under 100 bucks. So, not too bad. Um, rag chew on your PC or tablet or smartphone via Echo Link. Guys is going to tell us all about Echo Link. Rag chewing is hand speak for just, you know, talking. Just talking. <clears throat> about nothing in particular. Uh, you can learn about astronomy on Skynet every Saturday night at 9 p.m. on the Dallas Repeater, and Taz is also going to talk about that. And you will want to set up your hand shack. Joe is going to talk to us about that. And you can make contact via satellite and bounce some signals off the moon and really fun stuff like that. And Doug's going to talk about that. And David, I'm not sure what you're going to I'm just going to make it up and go on. <laughs> <laughs> and most importantly is to have fun. That's and, me, right there. And, <laughs> 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 okay, <sorry. laughs> um, so, um, you know, the, the main thing that Doug, all, Doug, Doug always says is to find what you enjoy and, and do that one thing. For me, it was wanting to do sky storm storm spotting. And uh, when I went to the Skywarn training earlier this year, I realized that I really couldn't do it unless I had a hand license. So that was why I decided to get mine. And uh, I'm also interested in the satellite stuff. So uh, anyway. <clears throat> so. I want to put 
the science with the math. Uh, electronics has always fascinated me. Single processing has always fascinated me. And, and I can do the integrals, but I want to twiddle some knobs and actually process some signals. And I figured what a great way to do that, to have some fun with it, would be to get into ham radio. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, different ham bands, the ARRL band plan, uh, and modes of communication. So we'll hit a few modes of communication. So what exactly are ham bands? <laughs> this is one of my favorite ham bands, the Bacon Bits. <laughs> Singing their hit song, Shaking My Bacon For You Baby. <laughs> so we're not exactly going to talk about this. This is just kind of fun. But ham bands. So what do we talk about when we say ham bands? What do we actually mean? Well, let's talk about what is a band. Well, it's just a sector, section of the spectrum of the you know, electromagnetic spectrum. So it's got all these wavelengths. And so radio frequencies occur at one end of the spectrum. And so a band just describes a small section. We can carve these up into sections and just look at different slices of the electromagnetic spectrum. And these channels are usually set aside for the same purpose. You'll have a section that's dedicated to maybe cell phones or a section that's dedicated to certain licenses of ham radio, um, you know, water, marine communications, etc. So that's what we're talking about when we say a band. Then uh, the ranges of radio frequencies are divided into these basic uh, sub-ranges. And uh, we've got high frequency, very high frequency, and ultra high frequency. And they're divided up between these uh, ranges, 3 to 30 megahertz, 30 to 300 megahertz, and 300 to 3,000 megahertz, or 3 gigahertz. So um, looking at that, guess what? You already know the answer to one of the questions on the technician license question pool, because this is one of the questions that's in the pool. So we would like to be able to communicate without a whole bunch of interference going on, because if we had just a whole bunch of interference, we wouldn't understand anything or hear anything that anybody had to say or be able to use any equipment or devices. So we would like to have efficient use of the spectrum and prevent as much interference as possible. So we allocate certain services into certain ranges of bands in the spectrum. So we have broadcasting, mobile radio, navigation devices, they're allocated certain bands of the spectrum and they're non-overlapping ranges of frequencies. So you can look, we'll look at the band plan here in a minute that'll show how this works. The FCC, they are the agency in the US that regulates and enforces the rules for the amateur radio service. Part 97 is the part of the FCC rules that contains the rules and regs governing amateur radio. This is an answer to another question. You're gonna know fairly few of these before I get that. So here's what section 97101 part B of the FCC rules actually states. Each station licensee and each control operator must cooperate in selecting transmitting channels and in making the most effective use of the amateur service frequencies. No frequency will be assigned for the exclusive use of any station. Upshot of that is, no one owns or has any particular special privileges or rights to any one frequency. So here's a little history on the ARRL, the Amateur American Radio Relay League. They were founded in 1914, and that's the National Association for Amateur Radio in the U.S. Like Kelly said, it's kind of like the Astronomical League of Radio. And they have upwards of 158,000 members, and it's the largest organization of radio amateurs in the U.S. So it's a big group. And their core purpose, very similar to TAS, where we're promoting astronomy, is they want to promote advanced the art, science, and enjoyment of amateur radio. And so what I've done is I've uh, went to their website and pulled the, uh, just the graphical representation of the band plan. They've got it in uh, non-graph mode, so if you go to their website, you can look at it and read through it. But to show it concisely, here's what the band plan looks like. So what we've got is it's color-coded by mode, and we have each band listed, and you'll be able to look and see what exactly, which slice of the electromagnetic spectrum is covered by that particular band. The colors are the different modes. If you look off to the right, you'll see that red means RTTY and data. And then the green, we have phone. And then we have squiggly lines for the CW, which is Morse code. We'll talk about some of these different modes here in a moment. So you can take a look at each particular band, see what modes can be used in that band, and then you'll see some letters off to the right where it says like E, A, G, T. Well, those are right under the legend. Those are the different levels of licensing. Uh, folks that are allowed to talk and communicate 
on those bands. So we have E for Amateur Extra. Thank you, somebody with a laser pointer, appreciate it. <laughs> um, a is Advanced, uh, G is General, Technician, and Novice. So you can take a look at a particular band. So like the 17 meter band, which is in the middle. Um, Whoa. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't set the screen on fire. Yeah, we're not here. <laughs> so you see it goes between these frequencies. Then we've got up to this point we can use our TTY. Here's the green where we can use some. And this is accessible by amateur extra, the advanced, and the general licenses. So this is just a very concise way to just represent all the uh, information in the ARRL band plan. And there's some additional information here that you can read um, on your own. But that's basically how it's broken up. And so the golden rule is just to be kind. You know, listen before you start talking. Get on a frequency and listen and see if anybody's already talking or transmitting. And it's just common sense. You know, just listen before you talk. Um, and regardless of mode, whichever mode you're using, to see if it's in use prior to operating. If you're there first, you have, be nice to know that other folks are going to do the same for you. They're going to try to keep the frequency as clear as possible. It's unrealistic to expect 100% interference-free communication. There's always going to be some bit of interference. Just try to keep it as minimal as possible. And if you know you're, if you're not transmitting or talking, you're not contributing to that interference. So just be kind. So now let's talk about some modes of communication. Now that we've seen the band plan, and we've seen some different types of modes. We'll talk about just hit on some of the major ones. So we have CW, which is element one, which was not on the previous list. So if you're wondering why the technician likes to start off with element two, three, and four, it's like, well, what happened to element one? Well, that's the Morse code. So CW, continuous waves. So basically a carrier wave is just keyed off and on. We've all heard it. And there's some cool apps on phones. I just downloaded one the other day where you can type in in English and hit the button. It'll beep, 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 beep. You know, it's really pretty neat. <laughs> And there are translators, so if you don't know Morse code, you can still have fun with it. And there are um, ones on the computer that you can type in, and it'll trans transmit it over the airwaves as the CW. So it's really pretty neat. Um, so basically what's going on is signal, and you'll see some big words there. Don't freak out when you see the word heterodyne. I'll be frequency oscillators, like, oh yeah, don't want to get too technical. I promise there's no math in this at all. <laughs> Um, heterodynamous means you're taking a signal, mixing it with another signal to create yet more signals. Beat frequency oscillator is the equipment that does that. And so that's what's going to allow it to be audible, these changes of, uh, into impulses that we can hear. Changes of into the beep, 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 beep. See, I've got my own built in beat frequency oscillator. I can do it myself. Ooh, there's some going on right now. <laughs> Very cool. So if you're interested in that, or if you already communicate using CW, you, know, you probably have seen or have one of these devices. These are uh, these are the keys that you use. And the, you, the one with the picture of the fingers, that's the up-down traditional, the one that we probably used to seeing all the time. And the other one is a horizontal where you can waggle the paddle back and forth. It just depends on how you choose to transmit it, what your feel is, um, how you like to do it. <laughs> <laughs> So that's uh, Morse code. So then we have radio teletype, which is the RTTY. And you've probably seen it, you know, I actually been to a newspaper or, or a radio station or you've seen on TV and have the big machines and you rip off the copy. And, and I, I like to see in Good Morning Vietnam where they've got all the teletypes lined up and he comes through there and he's ripping off all the pages and hands them to the twin guys that circle and mark them all up before he starts reading. That's a radio teletype machine. And so we can certainly use it for amateur communication, also used for message handling, military use we've seen, uh, traffic handling, and civil defense. Um, some advantages to that is you don't have to be there when the message comes in to receive the message. You can just pick it up when you get there. Um, you can retransmit on another frequency, which is why it's good for traffic handling, because if the message comes in, it can be sent out to other locations. And you actually have a hard copy of the transmission when it comes through. So when you pick up that message, you've got a printout of it so you can read it at your convenience. Um, some disadvantages, it's not as personal as talking voice to voice, obviously. And you're not talking at the same time. Somebody types, it's transmitted, and then somebody types and it comes back. And here's some pictures of radio teletype. There's a gentleman sitting at his teletype at the ready, ready to type at a moment's notice. 
and he's got some other cool equipment there. Um, I'm so new to this, I don't even know what all that stuff is, but it looks impressively cool. And then there's the Model 19 RTTY, which I think, I'm not sure what the current Model RTTY is, so I'm taking that this one is fairly not ancient, but maybe 60s, 50s, 60s, maybe. It was a nice picture. Just to give you an idea of what these machines look like. So, do, that's an analog way to communicate. If you want to do the computer-generated RTTY, TSK-31 will get the job done. This is done over the computer. Um, it stands for phase shift keying at 31 hertz. So, um, it's real keyboard-to-keyboard -keyboard text. It's really pretty cool. It's kind of like geeky instant messaging. Because you can sit at your computer and you're typing, you can get on a frequency and start communicating. Um, it was developed by Peter Martinez, and it was introduced in December 1998 to the radio community. And so it's typically in the single sideband uh, connected to the sound card of a PC or a laptop that's running the software. And you're like, okay, she just threw another word at me, single sideband, what does that mean? We'll, get to it. we'll talk about that next. Um, so the software produces a tone and it's fed through a microphone or some other equipment that you've got hooked up in the, in the, signal, in the system. And that transmits a signal that's coming from your radio. We have a transceiver that's in the circuit as well. You have a transceiver and some equipment that to your computer sends out the signal. And as the software changes the state back and forth between two different states very rapidly, it was changing the phase of the signal. So there's, that's why they call it phase shift key. And then the output is fed into the sound card, the audio comes through your computer, and the, the message gets decoded on your side. So that's just kind of a basic big picture of how it works. Some advantages, well you can use a piece of your laptop that you already have. I was at the, the Ham, the Plano Amateur Radio Club Ham uh, Field Day in June, and Doug came in, he was like, yeah, I sat down and popped his laptop out, took a few chords in, and he was up and running in no time. It was really fun and uh, interesting to watch and see how it works. Um, the software, there's free software that you can download. Um, there's very little equipment. You've got computer, radio transceiver. Um, you might have a, a modem where you are running it through your computer. And it takes up very little bandwidth. Uh, it works in conditions sometimes where voices or other modes will not work. So if there's too much interference for you to get through on voice, you might try your computer and see if you can get through. Um, since it's narrow bandwidth, um, you might have more uh, fortunate communication with TSK. And it's not intended for large blocks of text, so you can't send huge whopping messages. And you really don't want to send critical data over. Um, if you want something with error control and, and you want to send large messages, this is probably not the tool for that. So here's the setup. I went out to the web, to the internet, and just Googled and looked around for some pictures, and I wanted to give these folks, I wanted some, to find their names, but all I found were their call signs. This is IZ1CRR setup. They have an indoor setup, and they were kind enough to list the equipment. So they listed the type of uh, transceivers that they have, antenna, and they've got a ThinkPad laptop that's running this DM780 software. So that's how minimal of a setup it is. You don't have to have a lot of large equipment. This person, G7OEM, has a portable system. He's got, it may not be a car battery, probably a 12 volt uh, power David. pack system. Yeah. I got the car that I should have changed that. But you probably could, you know. There's one there. Yeah, there it is. Okay. So there's the digital modem, which has the display. So you don't need a computer screen. It just will come through there. And then there's the radio transceiver and keyboard. So you have very minimal equipment. And so here's what a PSK31 looks like on the screen. They've got the um, frequency on the left, so it shows all the different frequencies. And then you have on the right what's called the waterfall display. So you can see all the signals. You can monitor several at one time. Find a signal that's strongest. So instead of dialing up and down and wondering oh, if you're getting close to a good signal or not, you can look across the frequency spectrum and say, oh, there's a really good signal right there, and just home right in on it. And uh, and also, because you have this link on the screen, you see all this, you know, it looks like the matrix, you know, with the cool 
you know, waterfall coming down. Well, that's a history of the signal. You've got, you know, 20 to 30 seconds maybe of signal that you can see, so you can see the history. So we talked about single sideband, mentioned it, so what is that? So this is just a refined um, mode of amplitude modulation, and it more efficiently uses power and bandwidth. And it's a mode of communication that's most commonly used on HF radio bands. So this was applied for a patent back in 1915, John Renshaw Carson, and the Navy experimented with it um, around World War I, and then after World War II, amateur radio operators started getting in on it and then Strategic Air Command established it as their radio standard for aircraft in the late 50s, and it's become standard for long distance communication since then. So here's what's going on with the single sideband. So at the top, we have what's called the baseband signal, the unmodulated signal. In the middle, we have a full amplitude modulation. So we have these two humps on the side. That's one of the sidebands. This is the other sideband. And then the spike in the middle is the actual carrier signal. So we call the one on the right the upper sideband, and the one on the left the lower sideband. And I didn't get into it in the band plan, but there are conventions on which sidebands to use on different bands. So you can read about that. Uh, but some sidebands will they'll tell you on this, you know, frequencies we'll use the upper sideband, or on these frequencies we'll use the lower sideband. So some advantages, it uses less bandwidth, higher power efficiency. So it's using less bandwidth, less width of the actual range on the spectrum, more communication can happen in that same band without overlapping or interfering communication. And then a thing called fading doesn't occur. Fading happens, you have, might have the signal increasing and decreasing in strength as it comes in. Well, if you're using amplitude modulation, you've got both side bands in the carrier, well, all of those are different frequencies, and as they are being transmitted, the, the uh, atmosphere is acting on them in different ways. So um, the carrier signal may get acted upon a little differently than the side band. And you hear differences in that interaction as you are listening to your communication. So if you're only transmitting one of the sidebands, well, you just got that one piece to it, so you're not going to have this fading phenomenon. So some disadvantages, you got to have some more complex equipment. Um, you can't just have a little handy talkie. You've got to have a transceiver that will communicate with SSB. And I don't know, I was looking, trying to find out the prices, but usually when I see the words more complex equipment, I think, okay, that's got to mean more money. <laughs> Hobbies like these are never cheap. Um, and a little change in frequency will change the quality of the transmission. If you're away from the carrier signal, you'll hear it's very garbled or kind of quacky, Donald Ducky sounded. And then when you get very close, um, then it changes very uh, little change will cause a, a great change in the quality of the signal. So you do have to have uh, good frequency stability. Now these are some helpful sites. I use these in my search to put this together. Like I said, I've only been doing this since March, so I'm still learning a great deal. Um, and any information, if I that is incomplete or erroneous, it's fine, all well, because I'm just such a newbie. But I'm learning. Uh, the known access technician class study guide, uh, those are what I used. I studied for two weeks for the technician class exam and then went and took it. Um, I'm doing mine just one at a time just because I don't have time to study for all of them at the same time. ARRL, there's uh, the considered operator's frequency guide. And if you like uh, a, uh, to read about the rise of SSB, I was kind of looking through this article, the amateur radio and rise of SSB. And it was a cool history of how SSB kind of came around. And, uh, and if you like a technical read, the introduction to radio teletype by Irvin M. Hoff, um, that was a, a technical read and it's got uh, schematics and equations and things. So if you really like to get into the nitty gritty of it, then that's a great, would be a great article to read. Ham Universe is a, a it looks like a pretty cool website. And then analog communication, fact sheet, God see is where I got the information for a single sideband. Um, and then there's the document SSB, Understanding the Basics. It looked to be a very a straightforward, no nonsense handout. It's a couple of pages that just really gives you kind of the cliff notes about SSB. So it would be a good read as well. 
And then also we just want to have fun. So get out there, as Kelly said, get a radio, start talking, or get on Echo Link and start listening, or go out and just, you know, get a radio and listen. If you don't have a license and can't transmit yet, we'll just listen on with somebody, or go to a field day, which is kind of like a star party um, for radios. And I was at the last one, and they had it set up with a call sign so that people that didn't have a license could talk. I was helping a young lady, she was 12, and her mom, they wanted to talk. Their husband and son had licenses, and they wanted to try it. And so we, they had it set up so they could talk and make some contacts, and it was very thrilling for them, and they had a great time. So I encourage you to get out there to an amateur radio club, at least go talk to some folks and see what they do and have some fun. What do you do? It's on. Is it on? What do you do after you get your ham like Have fun. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so talk. Uh, one of the advantages of living in a highly populated area like the Dallas Fort Worth area is there are a lot of FM repeaters. Whereas the people who spoke before were discussing amplitude modulation. Eric and I are going to demonstrate with the equipment we use for frequency modulation. According to the ARRL, the most popular form of communication is VHF and UHF, according to the ARRL. One, Eric, please highlight the two meter and 70 centimeter band. Two meter. Note that in the VHF band and the UHF band, all privileges are available to all classes. Also, with the advent of kids these days that are getting into it that are computer centric, their desire to transmit digital information as versus talk on the phone, microphone, is becoming more prevalent. So I was looking to get into ham at a low cost. So I called my buddy Joe on the phone and he said, you, you need to go to Power Works and you need to get this radio. And right there. That is a Woshan UV3D. <coughs> the particular unit that I have is for the 144 to 148 megahertz, 420 to 450 megahertz. It will scan more frequencies than that, and it's interesting to scan and listen. So, Joe also recommended that I join radioreference.com, in which all frequencies in the greater DFW area are listed. I also <laughs> use some of the local ham sites to download the repeater frequencies. And so, when the unit was originally sent to me, This was the original antenna that came with the unit. This antenna is good for outdoors, but it's not good to transmit or receive in your car. I don't know why <coughs> the car acts like some kind of dead zone for the antenna. So I ended up purchasing this antenna right here, which supposedly gives almost 10 decibels boost, according to the manufacturer from PowerWorks, who was not that much more expensive. Eric is going to demonstrate the plug-in microphone that goes on the motion unit just by holding it out. You can take and clip the unit to your belt, and then <laughs> the microphone itself has a clip that you can take and put on the lapel not mine, so. of your shirt, I don't have a and on. just listen, because it's also the, mic the speaker, <laughs> then key it and speak into it when you need to release, and then you can hear the reply back again. So Chaz over here has been nice enough to coordinate Sark Skynet, like the Terminator movie Skynet show on the Dallas repeater 146.880 megahertz. Another person hosts the program, Tom, and it is at 9 p.m. on Saturdays. So if a star party is, say, rained out or canceled due to West Nile or the heat's just oppressive, well, I'm tuned in to Chaz's program. I decided that I wanted to start monitoring in the car. People will actually tell you traffic reports in the greater Dallas Fort Worth area. For instance, you're driving along, all of a sudden, hey, there's a wreck at Hillcrest and 635. 
Whatever you do, avoid this general area for the car. <coughs> I went to Texas Towers. They're a great outfit in Plano, Texas, and I don't want to pull my microphone down and doing this. And I bought this unit right here. It comes apart at the very base and has the mag clamp on there. You can see the extensive amount of cord that the unit has to fit on the roof. And I had to buy a small adapter for the unit from Texas Towers so that it would fit into this connector right here. Eric has a different kind of adapter that's Smaller. difficult to see from down there. It's used to connect into a form of a female connector we refer to as BNC. Most people BNC. might know these as an oscilloscope plug. Push, turn a couple of degrees, the thing's closed. Bayonet connector. Bayonet connector. So, when the, whether this antenna is on the top of my car or I bought, I liked it so much I bought another one and I have a cheap porch. It's just <coughs> wooden pylons and undulated aluminum. With the mag clamp, I just put it up on top of there and I'm able to hit repeaters as far away as Sherman. I've spoken directly with Joe out at his house off the Dallas repeater and I'm able to hit the Fort Worth repeater and Cedar Hill. Mine's bigger. You need to know where you are. Huh? Finish the explanation. You need to know where you are. Where you live. Where you live. Where's oh, where you live. What's your QTA? Okay. My location is Plano and Beltline Roads. Damn. And from there, Sherman, Rockwall, Rowlett, Cedar Hill, Fort Worth, and all that area right there. When I was first out in the alleyway behind my house, I heard some gentlemen speaking as I was just scanning. You could tell they were ham radio operators. I heard a town I didn't recognize the name of. I went on to Maps Google through the name of the town in it, and it turned out to be a town outside the greater Houston area. Now, how much they were power they were transmitting, and I have no reason to think that they were using one of the Dallas repeaters for a conversation in the greater Houston area. It's possible, but I don't think they were. So I think that might have been my only experience with something referred to as VHF ducting, where a signal makes it a great distance from some other location. And so, other than that, my break-in price uh, with the unit came the recharger. Would you demonstrate for the battery on the back, please, sir? Uh, it comes with a lithium-ion rechargeable battery. I wanted to see just how long it, it lasted. So I just turned it on in the living room, let the unit scan. 24 hours later, about a day I come back, the unit is still scanning and trying to find uh, signals. I did not transmit it at all. If you transmit, you're definitely going to reduce the amount of power. Motion. And that's the Hank T right there that Eric has. Motion transmits 5 watts VHF, 4 watts UHF. And with that, I'm able to hit all of those repeaters. Other than that, I, my entry cost was only $250. And there's plenty, plenty of rag chew in the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area on the repeaters. Not to mention all nature of radio programs I never would have thought about. VetNet, Veterans. Wednesday night, 7 p.m., all your ham radio clubs will have racies or that other emergency group, areas, areas racies, that other emergency group, they have meetings on the radio as well. Uh, I was surprised how much media is out there on VHF, UHF. I was just amazed. And then with some of the other presentations that are coming along at the Star Geezer Star Party, Eric, and this will be explained how he used his cell phone to listen in to Skynet, Chaz, using his cell phone at a star party, using cellular system connections. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric if he has anything to say at all. I will add a few more things on top of you. Uh, how much was your radio? 140, 160? $119. 119 for that radio. <coughs> 65. 
Comes with a little bitty rubber ducky. Antenna, not very good. There is a accessory antenna that's twelve dollars more. So good value for money. All in all, I took my test in March, got my license a week later, and Plano Hamcom was right around the corner. Went there, spent sixty-five dollars, and got a radio and was on the air. And that doesn't even on it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is. You gotta have it. Yeah, I just put it right here. You gotta get all these. So, at that point, I had also gotten on Echo Link and was able to listen in before I bought my radio. How do you get louder all of a sudden, you? <laughs> and the best way to do things, especially if you're going to go the route I took, go take the text test. Get on Echo Link. You can talk and listen through there. Then, when you're ready, go out, shell out a couple bucks for a radio. Yeah. Hundred dollars, less than less than a hundred dollars. I was on the air. <laughs> now, more will be spent later. <laughs> <laughs> Much more. Much more. I think that's it for us. It's Jess's turn for Echo Link. end of the evening. I will do that later on, too. Yeah, well, right now, let's talk about Peter the Bunny. Yes. <laughs> Repeater of the month. First of all, I have to talk about repeaters, Echo Link, and something called Skynet. Uh, yes. Okay. Here we go. Uh, now, I, I brought some of my setups, okay? I have a, the Ocean the radio. I've got this. Okay, well, anyway, I wanted to show you what my car setup looks like. Now, we haven't been talking about that, so I just want to show you. You know, it's amazing when you go looking for pictures on the internet, what you find. Okay, this is not my car setup, but I said I had to use it somehow in the program. So here it is. <laughs> if if something says something on one of the radios, how do you know which radio it's on? I don't know. Okay, here's my real setup, all right? Uh, I have this very, this exact antenna right here sitting on my car. I forget how much it was. What is 40 it? bucks. 40 bucks. Okay. Uh, this is the radio that's sitting in between two seats. I bought this at the Irving Hamcom for 60 bucks. Wow. Oh, from somebody back there. He was selling it as part of the DARC club. <laughs> Negotiated them downwards. So for a total of 100 bucks, I've got a mobile unit that I can go around with. But that's, that's I can do better than that. I'll show you uh, some other things in just a few, few moments. My first radio was the Oshan. I guess that's the more correct way of pronouncing it. Sort of like the ocean. So Oshan. Uh, it's a nice radio, about $120, absolutely. Bought that at the Irving Hamcom, Irving Hamfest, I should say, a year ago. My cheapest radio, though, is something different. It's this one right here. It's what Eric has. I got your beat, Eric. Where is he? Right here. Uh, there he is. Okay. <laughs> uh, I actually got it for $49. Wow. Same radio. Bucks less. There you go. So, oftentimes I will use this with something else. Uh, it's a little antenna that you can roll up and actually put it in your pocket. It's just a coil of wire. Do you have one with you, Mr. Woody? I forgot to bring mine. Oh, no. No? I have something okay. similar. Actually. This is called a Slim Jim J pole antenna, but you can actually why don't put it in your pocket. I have it hanging off the balcony at my apartment. Uh, before then, I couldn't get too many other places, but with just this 4 watts, I can get a lot of the repeaters all the way around with just the 4 watts on that little this radio. And that one is, I think, $23 plus shipping and handling, that antenna. Yeah, I've seen it. So, for $50 plus $25, so for about $75, you can have something you can get and talk to all over the 
Oh, world. But we'll get that in a <laughs> Not just the Metroplex, but we can go all over the world. Yeah. So uh, I can hook uh, my uh, mobile unit. I've got a power supply at home. I can put that on too and hook it up to this antenna. I can hook this up to that antenna and hook that up to it. So I can use any of those on the same antenna if I want to. Not all at the same time, but individually. All right. Ah. Now we have these little units. You've heard this thing called repeaters, I believe, a couple of different times. But let me explain a couple of things. We've also talked about echo link. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But let's talk about what a repeater is. OK, I have my radio over here. That's me over here. Does not just look like me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. OK, got my radio over here. Uh, David, do you have your radio over there? Yeah, OK, he's got his radio over there. OK, all right. Yeah. Yeah, but, but there's like a mountain between the two of us. We can't talk directly, okay? The, the mountain's in the way. But on top of the mountain, there's this antenna. When, you trans, when I transmit at one frequency, that's like an FM station, you know? You have lots of FM stations on your dot. Uh, this repeater will pick up my transmission and rebroadcast it on a slightly different frequency, and then everybody on both sides of the mountain can actually hear what's going on. That's what the repeater does. Picks up your transmission and retransmits it, usually at a higher power. Oftentimes 100 to 200 watts. They can go much higher than that, but you don't have to have that much power if you have enough power. Does that make sense? Did I explain it okay? How about uh, Mr. G, what do you think? Is that okay? And I'm okay with that? <laughs> is it two way or is it just one way? Uh, yes. <laughs> it's 10 way. It was that a good answer too? Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's it. The answer is is a duplex is really what you were probably asking. Uh, actually, you, you can transmit and receive. Depends on the type of radio you have. So the answer is yes. So you can be transmitting and listening at the same time. On two, transmitting on one frequency and receiving on another one. The answer is yes. So this one does. You transmit. You don't hear what you're transmitting. All right. Now I wanted to show you an actual repeater. Uh, the Dallas website, I could not pull off pictures, couldn't find them. But I live very close to a repeater, only three miles away. Someone had talked about joining a club or two or three or four. Yeah. I'm guilty of the four. <laughs> uh, I live in Mesquite, and so the Mesquite repeater is only about three and a half miles away from me, so I'm a member of Mesquite. The Dallas club was the first club I joined. Uh, along with the Rockwell Club, because um, that direction, my kids are there, my church is there. I also work in the Farmer's Ranch area, so Farmer's Ranch, uh, Carrollton, they call themselves the Metro Crest, so I'm a member of four different radio clubs, all right? But the repeater that's closest to me is the one that's not too far away from something that you might be familiar with. <laughs> Uh, have you ever been to the, how many have been to the Russell Planetarium before? We have had a number of events there. And most recently, we've had an event, I don't know, something that happens about every hundred years or so. I don't know. <laughs> but about a couple of months ago, we had something that happened. We're a planet between us and, oh, do you see something yourself in there? <laughs> When a planet goes between us and the sun, it's called a transit. And we had some telescopes. Well, we, I, I'm not the we there. I, I was set up at Brookhaven. We, we had a lot of people at Brookhaven, too. But uh, here's a setup. Oh, I don't know who this guy is. Yeah, I don't know who he is. OK, anyway. But in the background, here's Russell Planetarium. And in the background, you see this stuff right here? Uh, let's zoom in. Well, actually, zoom out. Zoom out. Because you have to zoom out to get this thing. It looks like this. This is a big antenna. Everyone has heard of KEOM, maybe? Have you? FM radio station, 70s, some 80s, you know. OK, all right. Uh, they broadcast, what is it, 50,000 watts? Something like that? 100,000? Top of this? 50? I think it's 50. On the top of this thing. But at the 400 foot level, I think it's that's the lower level, uh, is where the mesquite repeater is. 
Actually, they have three of them up there. But uh, I decided to show you one of them. And at the top of that one donut, you'll see a, well, a whole bunch of different yeah, I, I don't know if I want to talk about racks and equipment racks or anything, but that's what it is. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, but if you zoom in on it, you'll see some equipment sitting here. But that's the repeater. The repeater is actually a receiver that receives the signal and then retransmits it out at a different frequency. That's all it does. And it uses antennas similar to what we we're showing you here. They're sitting up at 400 feet. It's only putting out 150 watts compared to KEOM. It's 50,000. But you can go all over the place. I've hit that repeater from 50 miles away easily. Without any problems. How'd you get Wait. up there, Chaz? Huh? How'd you get up there? Uh, I, I stole these pictures. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, off a website. <laughs> yeah, we should. it would have been fun to be up there. With you. But I had been higher up and went further with just this. Uh, Dennis and I were flying. Yeah, he's a pilot. Dennis and I was up in the, uh, with the plane that his uh, club has, and with this, how far away is Cooper Lake from? Yeah, we were on the east side of Cooper Lake, and we were hitting the down of uh, the uh, Mesquite repeater without any problem at all. Full quiet, if you want to know what that is. We're at four thousand five hundred feet. Well, you know, that's we're a little bit higher than that, Antonio. Yeah. Okay. Direct line of sight. Direct line of sight. Nothing's in the way. Maybe a couple of birds. <laughs> All right. Do you understand about repeaters now? Yeah. Okay. Let's go on to something else. You don't have to buy this stuff if you want to get on the air. Don't. Don't need to. As soon as you get your hand license, don't need to buy any of this stuff. You can actually use a computer. Or if you have a smartphone, you can do that. Or an iPad, you can use that. If you've got any of those things, you can get on the radio. Because radios are hooked up to computers right now. It's called Echolink. And so the union of radios and computers have been happening for quite some time. But let me tell you a little bit about what, what's going on, how it sort of works. This is a way of Echolink being able to work. It's not the way. This, I'll show you the way in just a few moments. But this is probably one way it could work. OK, I'm here at uh, UT Dallas, right? I'm only using one of those little 44-watt radios, OK? Maybe I can hit a transmitter, if I, uh, a repeater, if I go outside here, OK? And so I transmit to the repeater that's somewhere close by. That repeater, of course, has a radio attached to it, a transceiver. It receives and transmits, OK? But maybe it's hooked up to a computer. And that computer is hooked up to the internet. And of course, that means it can be hooked up to a, another computer somewhere else. Maybe in my hometown of Columbus, Ohio. Cool. OK. Oh, well, that computer is hooked up to a transceiver, a repeater. And it can transmit the signal that I've transmitted in Dallas, Texas, and go all the way through to Columbus, Ohio over this whole big, long linkage. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. OK, what if I don't have a radio? <laughs> I can use a computer, an iPad, or a smartphone. Uh, I guess I left it over here. Uh, we're running kind of long, so I'm not, I'm not really going to do a demo on it. But I could, and I will at the break. If you want me to make a contact with the cell phone, we can do that. But as Echo Link on it, all it is is software. That's all it is. The hookup to the internet. That's all it is. All right. So I could transmit using the computer, iPad, or the smartphone. That's an Android. OK, that would allow it to connect to the internet, connect to a computer that's hooked up to a transceiver somewhere in the world. And it doesn't have to just go across the United States. It can be hooked up in Australia. Or where Celeste, my girlfriend, lives. I think she lives in the UK. Some of you in this room knows who Celeste is. You can talk to me later about Celeste. I fell in love a couple years ago at TSP. Anyway, all right. So that's another way of doing it. Uh, let's see now. 
Uh, if you have the software on a computer, the screen will look something like this once it comes up. It tells you about all of the different things that are sitting on there. In North America, there's over 2,000 of them. Uh, 1,300 in Europe, a few in Asia, a couple of in Africa. Uh, out there in the ocean, a couple of them. Wow. Uh, these are different regions throughout the United States. Region 5 is where Texas is. Uh, what is it, uh, 255, I think I see, okay. And over here, there's the Dallas Repeater. You can actually go through the internet, get to the Dallas Repeater, here on the air. and go and hear them on the air, no matter where you are. In May, I was visiting my folks in Ohio. I went this way, listened to Skynet, and actually participated in it, 1,100 miles away. And I didn't have a radio. I have this, a phone. That's pretty cool. Okay. Uh, let's see. Now, I could go to Ohio. Uh, Lancaster, Ohio is pretty close to my hometown. And we could sit there. That's in Region 8 and do the same thing. We could listen to them from here. That would be pretty cool, too. Uh, I'll do the demo later at the break. Okay. Now, do you understand about Echolink? How you can transmit radio? Using a computer? Do you understand that now? Questions about it? No? Okay. Well, uh, I became a member of the Dallas Club um, almost two years ago. The first meeting I went to, I walked in, and of course you have to introduce yourself as a newbie, and a little bit about yourself, and I said, well, I'm an astronomer. I work across the street at Brookhaven College. Their meetings are right across the street from the college. And the president of the club says, oh, I have to talk to you. <laughs> and afterwards, he talked to me. He wanted to create something called a net. I said, I don't know what that is. Uh, it's a meeting sort of on the air, amateur radio operators. And he said he wanted to do one on astronomy. And his name is Tom General, and he's right back here. Do you want to stand up? Come on down here. Say hi to Tom. Everyone give Tom a round of applause. Tom, come on down. So Tom had this brilliant idea of having something where we could talk about astronomy over the amateur radio frequencies. And so a year later, it took a year later, it finally came into being. Tom is really what we call the net control operator for Skynet. And it happens as Joe was putting up here on the Dallas repeater, which is 14688. Uh, this thing means private line. It's like when I grew up, we had party lines where you pick up the phone and <laughs> multiple people. Well, it's actually a, called a private line. And you put it in a tone so it's only this repeater frequency in this town. Anyway, on Saturday nights at 9 o'clock, you can actually hear Skynet, which is amateur astronomy on amateur radio. And it coincides precisely with observing stations that happen throughout the Metroplex that we have in Cedar Hill and Garland and, oh, here we go, one, two, three. Got <laughs> <laughs> four. Rockwell. Oh. Oh. See, I knew better to hold that very long. <laughs> go in the next month. Yeah, it's okay, anyway. <laughs> but Cedar Hill, Garland, Frisco, and of of course, rock wall can't forget rock wall. <laughs> and of course, we do have <coughs> Farmer's Ranch, historical park, right? Yeah. And we usually have that on Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday nights, right? Tuesday nights, September, October, November. And back up, I think, Thursday, is it Thursday usually? Night back, up. back up for rain or cloud nights. Okay, great. <laughs> now, what? how many of you are not amateur radio operators? How would you like to participate in? God. You don't have to have a radio. You do have to have a computer. You can actually go on you stream and watch this guy right here. He's talking. Uh, you can listen to the audio. Uh, you can join the Yahoo group if you want to, Facebook group. Actually, all you have to do is remember w5fc.org. That is the Dallas Amateur Radio Club website, and it has all these things listed underneath the sky. Then. So that's all you have to do. Just go to this website and it tells you all about these things. Tom, why don't you tell them a little bit about Skynet? I haven't told them anything about it except how to find it and how to get to it. 
This is Tom Cheryl. <laughs> well, thank you, Chaz. Well, Chaz is right. We, I went to him when he came on board and said that uh, he was an astronomer. He was a marked man at that point. <laughs> because uh, that's just something that I knew a lot of amateur radio operators had an interest in. And you've got quite a few of them here who are amateurs. Uh, probably completely separate from astronomy because it's an interesting and kind of geeky hobby to begin with. Well, as a kid, I was very interested in astronomy and, and enjoyed it. And there were people that talked about it quite a bit on the radio, but everybody always lamented, why don't they do an astronomy net? Well, you got to try and do it. So I've been waiting around for somebody like Chaz to come along that had an interest in this because my knowledge is probably not adequate enough to handle a net week after week after week. Well, Chaz came on board. He's co-net control. He's the guy who answers all the questions, at least initially. Now Kelly is on, wherever Kelly went. All right, there you are. Kelly's on every week. She's, she, uh, as you know, she is the uh, ambassador for Curiosity, this uh, wonderful um, information and updates on that as well, course astronomy, anything having to do with astronomy. Joe is on every week and, and supports us. And Eric, I finally saw you for the first time. Eric he was over there, there too. And he was over there. There he is. Oh, Hugh. Hey, all right. Yeah, there she is. Some of these people I don't know by, by look. I just know you by voice and maybe call sign. But all these guys make the net work. And we also get, through the streams, folks uh, come on board listen in there and we're getting a lot of cross-pollination now too people that are coming in and enjoy amateur radio they're getting into astronomy i'm going to join tas tonight if you guys will let me yeah. Yeah. so maybe i should talk about the net well it's an hour and a half long starts at nine o'clock saturday night on our repeater uh, we talked about, and, and Chaz helped put this together, the structure of it. We have a topic of the evening. This week, tomorrow, will be kind of an open mic thing. People can talk about whatever they want, which they do anyway, but this is the official forum, and they can do it. Uh, we talk about uh, the objects, uh, 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 topic, uh, say, constellation or object to be, uh, particularly view, what's in the sky tonight, what's going to be in the sky over the next a few days or a week or month for that matter, things to look for. Space exploration, um, what's uh, happening there, usually pulled from the NASA sites or from space.com, all sorts of things. And what's really interesting is that runs 90 minutes, but some of the best conversation comes after the net is over when people start asking questions and answering questions. And of course, the master of ceremonies over here is quite good at providing some, some really good information. And he's just one of those people that's still awake. <laughs> 10 30 at night. For me, I get up at 4 a.m. So I, I sometimes go a little loopy, folks. I, I have to admit, that's a long day for me. And uh, last thing I'll tell you, and then, then I'll let you get back to everything. But um, we just uh, started Wednesday a new repeater for the Dallas area it is all digital D star system. The Dallas Amateur Radio Club is put on <laughs> line. 1.2 gigahertz microwave, 440 and two meters. We're still working out some of the kinks. The 1.2 is now up and running and we're testing it. So we continue to do our thing in the amateur radio, which is to go on to the next thing, which is digital FM radio, simultaneously sending data and voice over the same frequency simultaneously multiplex. So uh, if you're interested in something like that, we're, we're one of those clubs that does it. I highly recommend if you've not gotten your license, it'd be a great place to start. There are a lot of people that have shared interests, the same interests that you do. Uh, they're in this room. So please consider it. We'd love to have you on board. We build radios, we build antennas. Radio astronomy comes into that category as well. There are some nice antennas that you can build member of, uh, well, member of, uh, oh, what is it? I want to join Sarah, is it Sarah? The Society of Amateur Radio Association of, of, of Amateur Astronomy Radio, I don't know, you know what it is, Sarah. Amateur Radio Astronomer. Thank you. <laughs> it's, that's new to me. Okay, I'm done, thank you.
I put him on the spot. He didn't know he was going to do that, by the way. Yeah. All right. Uh, questions about repeaters? Echo Link? Skynet? What? No? I'm out of here. You're out of here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, we're going to go over. I don't think I need that either, do I? We're going to go over the ham shack. Now, you know, when I got into astronomy, I went overboard and bought a whole <laughs> bunch of telescopes, right? I had six at one time. <laughs> got rid of them now, downsized. But I didn't want to do that when I got into ham radio. It's a radio, but as it turned out, <laughs> That's working out for you. <laughs> As it's turned out, what I wanted to do in my segment was show you my ham shack and what, how I set it up, okay? This was the hardest thing for me when I got in it because I didn't know, you know, hey man, all these wires and stuff and what does this thing do, what does that thing do? And you look through a catalog, there'll be 9,000 pieces of equipment but you have no idea, you know, an artificial ground. <laughs> wow. Do I need one of those? Yep. Well, it's that big potting <laughs> soil. That's what an artificial ground is. <laughs> All right. Now, well, anyway, here's my ham shack. Of course, it, you know, hey, we've got to do remote control, right? We do it on a telescope, right? Remote control. Well, you do the same thing with a laptop. See, it's looking at the same frequency as this little bitty screen on this radio right here. So now I got a big screen so I can see it with my bad eyes. All right? So this laptop is plugged into this radio which is an ICOM 7000 and it's what I would call a, a multi-band, all-band radio. It picks up basically everything you saw on that chart earlier except frequencies above 70 centimeters. More than, you know, 23, I don't think it picks that up. 35 doesn't pick that up, right? But all the other bands it picks up, including the repeaters. It's a real good mobile radio, because you can mount this sucker in your car with what's called a screwdriver antenna, and it has a remote that you can put there to change the frequency of the antenna, all right? And you can basically talk all over the world and to the repeaters, both of them. Icon 7000, and there's my little uh, ocean, or however they say that, little handy talkie sitting in its uh, charging station. Well, this has got a speaker built into it, but if you had it in the car, you'd buy an extra speaker, wouldn't you, so you could hear it better, right? You wouldn't use the one in the radio. So I did the same thing. This is just a little mobile speaker, so I get a little bit better sound that's pointed right at me, okay? All this other equipment does certain things, so let's kind of go through it. Now this is a mobile radio. Most mobile radios run off of 13.8 volts. The voltage you get from the battery, all right, because they're going to be connected up to the battery, all right, so 13.8 volts. So it doesn't have its own power supply, just like a telescope that, or a mount that doesn't have its own power supply. So you got to go buy a power supply. <coughs> All right, so I bought this used Pyramid 35 amp, peak 30 amp continuous power supply from an old guy in Arlington, Texas, that that's all he does is rebuild power supplies and sells them at different ham fests. I went to his house and picked it up for 80 bucks. All right. And he alters the circuitry, and it's 13.8 volts, period. The little dial that changes the voltage doesn't work anymore. He turns it off. Okay? 
So it's got two gauges, one is volts and one is amps. One is volts and one is amps. So that all this thing is doing is powering this radio. <clears throat> That's it. I could get a battery and set it on the ground and run the cables down here to a battery and do the same thing. All right. Of course, this plugs into the wall. I'm sorry, this plugs in, yeah, this plugs into the wall. This little gauge right here is, is what's called a SWR gauge, standing wave ratio. All that is <clears throat> telling you is how much is of your forward power is going out and how much is being reflected back inside the ham shack with you. And that's a ratio. And you don't want anything coming back. You want it all going out. So there's two little needles. You can't see them in the picture. One shows forward and one shows reflected. And you want to lay that reflected needle down on where it's right, not moving at all. Then everything's going out. So this tells me, this little gauge right here, tells me the SWR of the dual band that's a dual band radio of the dual band portion of the band because I've got a, a vertical dual band antenna outside all right so that's all this gauge tells me it's looking at the two meter 70 centimeter frequencies the two that are on the repeaters and it's telling me what my signal is doing. Oh, there's a little box under here. What is that? Well, when I get on those other frequencies, 80 meter, 40 meter, 17 meters has been pretty good, 20, 10, I gotta tune my antenna. <laughs> gotta tune my antenna. This is a, a manual antenna tuner. Again, it's got a SWR meter on it with forward power and reflected power. And what I do is I dial up a frequency. Okay, let's see. Right here, I'm on 40 meters right now. So I dial up 40 meters, I dial around the band, and there they are, rag chewing right there. Bunch of old guys talking about the weather. Okay, I want to talk to these guys. So I switched this radio to radio teletype. That way, when I key the mic, the signal goes up. You've got to talk to get a signal out on a, on a single sideband. But if I dial this radio to radio teletype with a little button right here, you just push it, RTTY. Then I can key up this mic. They won't hear me in the red tube. I'm right on their frequency. They won't hear me. I key up this mic. This gauge tells me, hey man, half of that power is coming back in here. Because this side of it goes up, maybe up in here somewhere. So first thing I do is I dial up the inductance. And then I start turning this knob and trying to drop this needle all the way to the bottom. It only takes a few seconds to do that after you get used to it. All right. There are automatic antenna tuners that you just push a button and they auto-tune. Okay. One of these days I might get one of those. Alright. This is old school. <clears throat> So you dial up the frequency, you get your SWR right, you switch the radio back to single sideband, and you start talking to those guys, and you can watch this meter, and you can watch this meter and make sure you're getting the amps, and the volts are right, 13.8, and make sure none of it's coming back in. That's what those gauges do. All right, that's what those gauges. All right, then over here on the side, I just got a little, all, you know, scanner. I got another antenna up, and I can listen to everything from DFW to some of the amateur bands, and like the 
the radio clubs, bands, Dark is on there, I can listen to them on the scanner. All right, you pick up this frequency on that scanner. So I can actually listen to repeaters off of a scanner with no license. That was the first thing I ever bought right there. That was the first thing. Because you have to have a license to use Echo Link. And I didn't know about streaming across the computer. I didn't know anything about that. So first thing I bought was this, and I was listening on the scanner. Okay. So anyway, that's my uh, little setup. And boy, that's the most important piece of paper you can have in there. Because I'm not smart enough to remember all those. There's a little close-up of the icon, see it? Pretty neat radio. There's a close-up of the screen. Notice that you've got all the controls for the radio right here on the computer, so you can click these, and the radio does whatever you said it's connected. Ham Radio Deluxe is a software, it's free. There's a close-up of the power pack, close up of the MJF, there's the scanner, there's the band plan. Now, <laughs> wires. <laughs> Hundreds of wires. <laughs> All right. I wasn't about to cut holes in my wall and run conduit through the bricks no. on a brand new house that I had just bought. All right. Well, they make a device called the pass-through, and it's basically a board. And it's got all the connections on both sides. So all you have to do is run your cables, set, you know, put this in the window. It's all nice weather sealed. You put your board in the window so nobody can get in. And you connect all your wires up outside without cutting any holes. And they pass right through to the inside. How's that antenna tuner working for you? Great. It tunes with what? I'm, I'm just making fun of your message. Hey, man, don't make fun of my ground wire. Look how straight that sucker is. It ain't but two feet long. It's all the other wire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I'm, notice, I'm, I'm that, notice what else I did. You didn't notice this one. I've since buried this. But I have another ground clamp down here with a number six gauge copper wire that goes all the way around the house, or at least part of it. All right. <laughs> How far down is the rod? That's a 10-foot uh, rod. Oh, wow. <laughs> All right. So there's how you get the wires in. There's what it looks like when you step back. And I've since fixed this wire. See, there's that other ground wire that goes around the house. Just at ground level. And then I've actually got three antennas here. This is the one I'm using to hit the repeaters. It's a Cushcraft uh, 270. This one right here. Cushcraft 270. And I bought it off my uh, Elmer for about 60 bucks. He had it in his garage. Okay, it works great. And this is the little $39 J-Pole I bought off of eBay. They work great, don't they? They work pretty good, and I left it up there as a backup. If this one ever goes out, I can just come up here and attach the cable right here, and I'm back in business. So this one was 39 bucks, and this one was 60 bucks used. The long wire, here's the ballum. We ain't gonna get into that right now, but here's the little, this little box is another antenna. It's a long wire. It's 88 feet long. There's a wire coming out of here. I know you can't see, well there it is right there. It's going over this tree. I'll try to show you that. I also put a little gable mount up on my shed in the backyard and that's what all that's attached to. So that goes up over that tree, you know, over the top of that tree that it comes down. And I put a PVC pipe onto my metal fence post pipe 
just erase it up. And then I brought that wire down, and there it is tied to the top of that PVC coming on over the top of that tree. Now what I'm going to do next is I bought 50 more feet of wire, <laughs> and I'm going to either come this way or that way and run it out to 127 feet, which is a non-multiple of other frequencies. 127 feet. So I'm going to try to go out this way. <coughs> Why is it a non-multiple? Uh, because you can't divide it that right. Put it into uh, uh, well, 986 and get other frequencies. It's, it's to make the antenna work because it, you, what you, you don't want the length of your wire is going to affect what frequencies mm -hmm. we work on. You hear us talk about 10 meter or 20 meter or 40 meter, but we're referring to the wavelength right. of of our signal. And so when you use uh, an antenna, you want something that will optimally transmit on whatever that wavelength is. And we will use something that's a fraction of the wave. Now, however, in Joe's case, he's wanting to use something that's probably going to be using several different frequencies. 80 through 10. Yeah, so he's, he's going to use this, this random wire, but he doesn't want it a link that will cause it to not work on frequencies essentially. And so there are certain links that you want to avoid. And that's what he's trying to do here. And there's some and certain links that it really won't matter and then to make it efficient he's going to use the tuner, right? Right. Okay, there you go. All right. Sorry. Michael. No, thank you, David. Uh, here's my latest purchase is not in the first picture. All right. I went out there and bought an ICOM 880H D-Star. And let me tell you, it's pretty cool, but you've got to be a real geek to use it, all right? <laughs> it don't work like a regular radio. That's why a lot, you hear a lot of bad-mouthing about it, because it's old-time ham radio operators that still think you need to know how to do CW or you don't get a license, okay? That's just my opinion. All right? Now, what does this thing do? Well, let me tell you what I've been able to do with it. I programmed it without my software. Now, it took me about three hours to figure out how to do that, all right? Then once I got my software, I programmed it all up, all right? So, my software, if you buy one of these, I, I suggest you get the software with it. There's some free stuff for my con that will work, and you can program it with the free stuff, but you're going to have to buy the cable to program it from the so PC. So anyway, we programmed this up. Uh, I sent in an application. It's dark already. I'm going to try to go to the meeting and pay them. And uh, also join, what's the first letters on that? TIT, uh, the Dallas D Star group. I can't remember their call, total call sign. The last letters is TIT. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> anyway, the Dallas D Star group, I joined that group try to tender and make this because that's all they do is D star. And when I heard that DART, the Dallas Amateur Radio Club, was going to install a D star repeater, that kind of settled the issue. Because I wanted to be able to talk across their uh, D star repeater. I registered with the Mesquite D star repeater. You have to register. I mean, just like you do at TAS, when you buy one of these radios, you got to register first. And you register for free, and it might take a day or two for you to show up, all right? Mine was fairly quick one day. And I registered with the Mesquite D-Star repeater, and now I don't have to register anymore. The trick with this is, it uses your call sign to find you. 
It remembers the last repeater you talked on. And if somebody's trying to get a hold of you in Poland, they can get on a D-star repeater in Poland and transmit your call sign and your radio will receive that message. Okay? So it's like, like Echo Link Similar, similar concept as the echo like thing, but that's all built into the radio. So uh, what's cool about it, in my opinion, is the sound. I talked to a guy in the panhandle driving around in his car from the Mesquite repeater, and then he called for his son in Kansas City, and I was talking to both of them, and it was what we call full quieting, perfect sound. Better than a cell phone or a telephone, because it's digital. It came most of the way digitally until it hits a repeater. Then it goes out digitally and hits this radio. And digital is either there or it ain't there. It's just like your TV set. You either get a perfect picture or you get no picture. It's the same thing. Yeah. So uh, there's some neat books out there that I sent a few out to a few of the hams in the club. One of them's called uh, D Star for Dummies, and it's free on the internet. So if you're interested in this concept, just jump on the internet and Google D Star for Dummies. And there's a guy that wrote, you'll see a little deal, PDF file, you can download it. That's the one I'm going to read in detail because he talks about programming these radios uh, in simple terms. Okay. You want to copy down some of these sites? These are some really good sites or ham radio. Uh, this is where a lot of hams uh, record their log books. When they talk to somebody far away, they record it on QRZ.com. I've got a, I'm on QRZ.com. You can see who I talk to. You go there and type in my call sign, W1XWX. You'll find me, and I've got a little web page there too. But you can look at my log book. Right. Eham, you've heard about it. DX Zone, that's another good one. Talks about long distance DX, distant communication. Alright? DX. And if you want to buy something cheap, there is an Astro Mark for ham radios. Okay? You know, we go to Astro Mark, well here it is. QTH. If you'll copy that, swap.qth.com. You don't have to join, but I personally wouldn't buy anything from anyone that didn't have a call sign. For obvious reasons. Yeah. So most everybody there has a call sign that it's selling something. So you can always look them up on the FCC site. Call them up or whatever and see what if it's, if it's for real or not. So this is the Astro Mark of ham radio. Yeah. 73.
India, Europe, South America, and through Bluetooth in my uh, car, driving in from the Free Arctic Astronomy Campus. That's cool. To check on the weather as I'm getting home. That's great. So it's, it's actually way cool and very useful. We had somebody uh, sign into Skynet last week from Seattle, Washington. It's fun talking to one of my, one of my uh, friends in Plano. When you're in Singapore. Yeah, when I'm in Singapore, <laughs> right. Yeah, they're, they're, uh, uh, without the long distance charges, by the way. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I found it is if I need to get a message home real quick, it's a very efficient and quick way to do it. I'm going through the Wi Fi to hotel. <laughs>
spacecraft telemetry and the orbits of the satellites. Some of them are, are uh, rather short-lived and re-enter after a short period of time, so it's fun to watch the orbits decay, and then it burns up. Uh, there's people designing and building the satellites. Uh, there's talking to the astronauts on the International Space Station, and having fun. I'm very big on this whole having fun. If you're not having fun, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and I, people ask, well, why satellites? And I say, it's a lot like fishing. And they say, what do you mean? And I say, well, why do people go fishing? Is it because they want fish for dinner? Well, no, if I wanted fish for dinner, I'd go to the restaurant and I'd order fish for dinner, or because I'm actually a little bit cheap. I'd go to the supermarket, I'd buy fish, bring it home and cook it for dinner. But fish for dinner is not why people take a day out from work and go get a rod and a reel and rent a boat and go out to the lake and go do this all day and not catch any fish. It's because they're having fun. So what can you expect? Uh, unlike shortwave radio, the satellite passes are extremely predictable. The satellites are in orbits that you can calculate with a computer. Uh, but the advantage to this is you can look at when the satellite's going to pass overhead this weekend, and everything is predictable to the minute. So for whatever you're interested in, you can look and say, ah, there's nothing good on Saturday, but there's a bunch of good stuff on Sunday. So maybe Saturday we clean out the garage, and Sunday we play radio. Uh, if you're just on shortwave, sometimes the band is open, sometimes the band is dead, you don't know ahead of time. There's people that are trying to talk to other people and trying to get one person in each state, kind of like stamp collecting, but you got to work them all for worked all states to get the award. There's people chasing stations in faraway places, uh, what the amateurs call DX. There's grid square chasing. Uh, and the satellites operate in different modes. Not everything on the satellite is turned on at the same time. So there might be multiple transmitters, multiple receivers, but today this one's hooked up to that one. Uh, there's people talking, that is, they're doing voice with single sideband or FM, but there's other people and they're doing stuff with data, collecting telemetry, sending messages. And some of the stuff is fast and exciting and you have to keep up either on a mailing list uh, or check a website to find out what's happening this week because it changes on a regular basis. Uh, this isn't actually from this week, but if you go to oscar.dcar.org, it will show you for the last couple of days all the different reports that came in from different amateur radio operators for each of the different satellites, and it will tell you what they're reporting. If it's in blue, then they're reporting that they heard the transponder or the repeater. So one person, two people, and you can find the time slot. Um, yellow is telemetry beacon. <coughs> No signal. So if you want to talk to the astronauts on the ISS, then you're looking for something in purple <coughs> on this line. Um, some other things that you can kind of see, AO7 has an automatic mode where it switches between mode A and mode B on about a 24-hour cycle. So you can look at this and, depending on which one you want to do, figure out when to listen. Uh, that stuff that changes every week, or it changes from week to week, but some stuff stays the same every week. And if you're looking for something that's going to really occupy all your free time, um, <laughs> you can get into <laughs> orbital mechanics. And orbital mechanics, much like Ohm's law, hasn't changed much. So the nice thing about this is, is you can read up on it, and then when your <laughs> life gets busy, you can put the book down and go take care of stuff, and weeks or months later you can come back to it, and it hasn't changed. <laughs> <laughs> so you can pick up right where it left off. Uh, <laughs> uh, methods of orbit determination is uh, by Escobar, and uh, this one is actually by three different authors. So there's this myth that if you want to do satellites, uh, you need to have multiple large antennas, these great big, huge satellite dishes. Uh, you're going to need hundreds of watts of power and invest thousands of dollars uh, in radios and, and years of time in your life just for the basics so that you, before you even get anywhere to talk to anybody. That's <laughs> 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 in your backyard. Now, this is a myth. This is, a myth. This is a, actually a Canberra uh, satellite yeah. dish. That, that's a car. <laughs> <laughs> That's the myth. 
<coughs> what you really need to get started is a two meter HT, a two meter walkie talkie, a 70 centimeter walkie talkie or a 70 centimeter handheld scanner or just a regular scanner. Uh, and perhaps some homemade antennas. If you've got one of the all mode, all band radios like the FT817, hey, did you bring your ATC? Yes, that's right there. <laughs> if you've got one of these, you've got everything you need already. This is a nice, cute little radio. And did I mention I'm cheap? Mm -hmm. And this is not a cheap radio, but this does everything. Uh, it, it's small. You can throw it in your suitcase or your it's backpack. Small. And it does all bands from from 160 to 70 centimeters except uh, 222. Yeah, and all modes. And, and all modes. And it does voice, it does force code, it does side bands, it does FM, it does data, it does 1200 baud, it does 9600 baud, it's a packet of 8 KRS. I got one of those and I got nothing done for a month. <laughs> I just played radio the whole month. Uh, <coughs> so which satellites do you want to use? Well, it comes back to what do you want to do? Some of the satellites just use FM, some of them just do sideband or CW. And you want to look at what you want to do and what equipment you already have that you can use. This is Keith Q. Uh, he gives demos at almost all of the uh, local ham fests. Um, he's out of commission at the moment, but um, this is a commercial aero antenna. It's actually two antennas. There's a, a 70 centimeter elements going this way that you can't see very well. And there's three two meter elements going this way. It's hooked up to his 817 with a little battery and little heat stands out there and, and waves it and that's all there is to it. That's the whole satellite station. Uh, when I got started, this was my second satellite station set up on, on the back of the car. So this is a, a five eighth uh, mag mount that I, I made the mag mount on some parts from Home Depot. Uh, this is the, the downlink antenna and cost about 10 bucks. This, this is a tool from the, that I stole off of some gardening equipment from the garage. And this is the preamp, the, uh, the antenna, the signal going up to the satellite is from a 1980s vintage uh, walkie-talkie putting out about one and a half watts. And that's all you need for the satellite to hear you. They usually have very sensitive receivers. It's the signal coming down from the satellite that's the harder part. So this is a Hamtronics converter to get the signal to this radio and, and a battery. And the elements are held on with camping cord locks. The, the advantage to this is that you can take the elements out. This is the show and tell portion of our presentation. These come off, and then you can pull the an the elements out so that you can put them all parallel for storage. So you want to throw them back to the car and not have to take up a lot of space. And then these just slide on. And then when you hold it this way, they don't all fall out. <laughs> oh, this you can get from Home Depot. Uh, this is some pipe insulation. They sell them like an eight foot length. You just only need a couple of inches. Uh, and the rest of this is just some uh, phrasing or welding rod. So you got maybe five dollars worth of parts here. Very, very expensive, very complicated. There's only two places you got solder. Uh, the preamp I built from a kit, and just to prove that this is all really complicated stuff, it's held on with a strap from a, an old backpack, and it's powered by a nine volt battery that's taped on with some duct tape. <laughs> and connect it up with the The uh, spreaders are held on with some wooden spools and there's some plastic tubing to hold this in a loop. It's very complicated. Now, this is the uh, other view of the arrow antenna. So there's, there's three elements here for two meters and then there's seven elements going this way for 70 centimeters. And if you're on a satellite that does two meters and 70 centimeters, that's your whole antenna. If you're on a satellite that uses 2.4 gig gigahertz for the downlink, then this is your whole antenna. This is a corner reflector. There's a little dipole for 2.4 here. And this converts the signal down to 2 meters, and you feed that to a 2 meter radio. 
But that's your whole satellite antenna right there. That's it. So if you want to build your own satellite antennas, you have to stop and ask, well, why does the antenna work well? Does it work well because it, you paid a lot of money for it? No. It works well because it has pieces of metal that are the right size, right sheet, and correct position from other pieces of metal to make it a good antenna. And we say, hey, do you want to go buy a bridge? Well, if you're a municipality, you can't just go to a bridge. You can't go to the, to the, the bridge catalog and say, yeah, I'd like something in a suspension. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. If you want to build it, you got to build it out of stuff you can get. So this is a quote from, from Jerry Evans. Engineering is the art of making what you want from things that you can get. So you can probably get some pieces of wood and some metal uh, brazing rods and a piece of coax. You got five dollars worth of stuff invested in there. Uh, that's actually the Kent Britton Cheap Yaggy design. If you Google Cheap Yaggies, you'll find his designs. He's got them for all bands from uh, six meters up to 1.2 gigahertz. Um, you can also make antennas out of just cardboard and aluminum foil. That's another one of my complicated antennas. Four <coughs> pieces of cardboard held together with duct tape, and the inside is coated in aluminum foil. If you put the four pieces together in a pyramid style like this, it forms a horn antenna. And at 2.4 gigahertz, this has about as much gain as a two-foot dish, or a parabolic satellite dish. For 435 going up to the satellite, uh, you can use a corner reflector. There's a little dipole here, which is made out of some electrical metal tubing, a couple of screws, uh, and some other parts from Home Depot, five or six bucks, and again, some aluminum foil. And if you go to the dollar store, you can buy the aluminum foil for a dollar. <laughs> get the cardboard box for free. It's powering the camera. Uh, both of these are designed by, by Tony AA2TX. All right, so you, you don't want these. You want a parabolic dish antenna. Well, if you find an umbrella that, that's almost parabolic, you can make it into a satellite dish. So this is a parabolic dish. This is my Mickey Mouse antenna. <laughs> it's almost parabolic. It's a little bit of a deep dish. Um, but it's, it's got a, about 15 dB gain at, at 1.2 gig. Um, this is just a, it started life as an umbrella. And then I got some metallic thread from the craft store. You go all the way in the back where they have the Christmas stuff and you can get the, the thread in, in either red or green or black. And I choose black. But the, it's two or three thread fibers and then one fiber of the thread is actually metallic. So if you stitch this back and forth, the, the threads don't actually have to touch. You just need metal here to act as a reflector because you want a parabolic reflector. And the threads don't have to touch. They just have to be there going horizontally and vertically in both directions. The only real important part is the spacing. The spacing depends on what frequency you want to use it at. So at 1.2 gigahertz, you want about a half an inch of spacing between these. Okay, so maybe you don't want to do a parabolic dish. You think it takes up too much space, or you don't like opening umbrellas indoors. <laughs> <laughs> you could build a helix antenna. Uh, this is a 20 turn helix antenna that says about 11 and a half dB gain. And uh, we'll, we'll come to that in a second. So this. Again, since, since I'm cheap and I don't want to spend a lot of money, uh, but I want to get some gain, you can get the plans for the spacing between the turns and the diameter of the, of the helix that you want. And then you need uh, something to act as a reflector and something to, to support it down the center. Now, the, the criteria is that the center support can't be iron. Because if it's iron, then the, the property of iron is that it will disturb the inductance of the foil and the measurements that you have would have to be adjusted for it. And I didn't have the equations to do all the adjustments, so I don't want to follow the recipe. Um, so I got some, some copper wire at Home Depot, and I said, okay, I need a, a square tube made out of something like aluminum. 
And if you go over to the Home Depot section where they've got the square aluminum tubing, they'll happily sell you a piece about this long for $40. And I said, well, I'm cheap and I don't want to spend $40, but I want a helix antenna. So I used a method that, that I found out later is called design by browsing. <laughs> so if you go to Home Depot and say, I need something, I need something square aluminum about this long, um, and you walk around the store until you find <laughs> what you're looking for. And when you get to the bathroom section, you'll find these things called towel rods. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this is a 30-inch towel rod. And then you need something for the reflector that needs to be a certain diameter if you're following the recipe for this one. Uh, and it needs to be metal. It doesn't matter what kind of metal, but it, it needs to be at least this diameter. It could be square. It could be round. Uh, if you go over to the, the heating air conditioning section, you can find a pipe end cap that fits in, and then you just drill a hole. So you got maybe $10 worth of parts in here at most. And you say, well, how do I get that so it all comes out nice? Well, there's a, a simple way to build the perfect helix. You go to your recipe that you get from an article or, or from the, the book, and they'll give you the helix circumference and the spacing between the terms. So you make a box, and for your box, the, the width of the box is the circumference and the height is the spacing between the terms, and then you draw a diagonal line between this, and you do this on your computer so you can go edit, copy, edit, paste, 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 and you do all the turns, however many turns you want, and then you print that out and wrap it around a wooden dowel or, or something hard that's about the right diameter, and then you wrap your wire around that so that the wire covers all of the, the red lines. And then you stretch and turn it. And the problem is once you stretch this part, you twist that part, it just messes everything up. Uh, I didn't bring this one with me, but if you're, you're looking for a parabolic dish that doesn't fold up, you can use a snow sled saucer. And I say snow sled saucer, and everybody goes, ah, oh, in Texas? <laughs> <laughs> So you get on Amazon, you get on eBay, and you have somebody ship you one. And then you go back to Home Depot or Lowe's and you get some uh, metallic tape, and you tape the whole thing up. And it's, it's not perfectly parabolic, but it's close enough that we still get a bunch of gain. And it's cheap. All right. So you want to build a, a patch antenna. And, and the goal here is not to convince you that you should build a patch antenna or, or any of these other particular antennas, but to show that you can build antennas following recipes, just measuring cut and using things that you can get. So I found a, a recipe for a 2.4 gigahertz patch antenna, uh, and I used the top of an Altoids tin, and you, you cut off the, the corners according to the recipe, and there's only one solder joint that you have to do for this, and it's just an end connector on the back and, and the Altoids tin on, on the front. And if you're already an amateur, then you probably have a bunch of these Altoid tins lying around for other projects. So the satellites, you want to find out which ones are active now. Uh, if you go to the MSAT website, and I got the links at the end if you want to see them, uh, and you can look at the different color codes, and if it's pointed up, it's active, and if it's pointed down, then it's probably dead. Um, and then they have other codes for future launches. So if you want to use the satellite, you have to find out when it's available at your location because the amateur satellites aren't geostationary yet. So the satellite's gonna appear to come up over there and it's either gonna draw an arc across that way or it's gonna draw an arc across almost straight overhead. But it's gonna do different arcs on different days at different times. So you need to find out when uh, these will happen for the satellite that you're interested in for where you are on the planet. And there's a concept of the satellite footprint. The footprint is everybody that the satellite can see, and the footprint determines who's in range and who can talk to each other. If you don't want to install anything on your PC, you can go to www.heavensabove.com uh, and click on the link for radio amateur satellites, and it will give you a list for the next day or two of all the amateur radio satellites. And if you've picked your, if you pick Dallas beforehand, it'll give you the times for Dallas. And if you don't pick anything, then it gives you something for the spot in the middle of the Atlantic, which is not what you want. Um, if you get, you can also get predictions at, at amsat.org. And if you want to install the actual software, you can go to the AMSAT site and download the software to install on your computer. 
this is what one of the, the programs looks like. It's called NOVA. So for the, the satellite AO51, this is the satellite footprint. This is the, the part of the Earth that the satellite can see at the height that the satellite is actually at. So if, if you're inside the footprint and somebody else is inside the footprint, then the two of you can talk to each other through the satellite, potentially. Uh, if, if you're in Dallas, then at this moment, AO51, you're not inside the footprint, so you can't use it. So what do you want to do? You want to have fun. This is the important part. You want to have fun. But what's fun for you, you have to find out what's the fun part. So is the fun part that you just want to make a single satellite contact just to cross it off your list and say, I did it? Or are you interested in, in Morse code? Are you interested in voice? Do you want to do chasing of, of the grid squares, chasing DX? Or maybe you don't want to talk to people at all. You just want to play with the data. Or experiment with digital signal processing or just collect and analyze the satellite telemetry, or help build one of the satellites, or perform breaching calculations. Oh, all the ones with stars on them, you don't actually need a license to do these things. So one of the things that I do, besides hooking up small radios to big antennas, is digital signal processing. And on some of the uh, amateur radio satellites, we use Reed Solomon and Viterbi decoders which I won't go into. But this is the same sort of technology that NASA and JPL used with the Voyager missions out at the outer planets years ago. But the beauty of all, all this is that you just need a computer and a sound card connected up to your radio. And you download some software and you run the software and it does all the work for you. Any modern computer will do, almost any sound card will do. And I used to say you have to have the radios, but it, it's actually only the case that you or your friends have to have radios. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's an interesting story because when one of the satellites got launched they were going to put up, put it in a mode that required a special radio that I didn't have and I was too cheap to go out and buy it but I found two people who had already gone out and spent money uh, and I wanted to do the digital signal processing on, on the signals so I convinced them to record these 50 megabyte recordings and then uh, send me the recordings of the satellite so I still don't have the radio, but I finished the computer program that does all the analysis. So if your friends have radios, uh, digital signal processing. So you have a sound card, but you run software on your computer. The computer analyzes the sound coming in, and you now have a 9600 baud modem or a 364 modem or a special BPSK1000 modem. And it's the, the DSP software that actually does all the work. You don't have to do it or even know how it works to have fun with it. You just hook up the sound card to the radio and it generates back the, the ones and zeros that came from the satellite and then you decide what you're gonna do depending on what you think the fun part is. So one of the telemetry programs that I wrote, this is the, uh, the solar panel page from that and it's got the different voltages, currents and temperatures from each, each of the six uh, solar panels. Uh, from the decoded telemetry, and then this is what the actual battery tray looks like and, and what the uh, battery control regulator uh, looks like. And then we've got all the telemetry values. When you've got this hooked up, the telemetry will be coming down live, so all of will be changing in real time. And as the, the satellite turns and spins on the solar panel page, you can watch all the telemetry values change. So the solar panels that are in, in eclipse will all drop down to zero and the ones that are in sunlight will have the voltages and currents go up. Uh, and if you don't want to see the pictures, you just want the numbers, you can get all the numbers. But the, the problem with this is this isn't interesting to, to the fifth graders. So you gotta have pictures to keep everybody interested. Uh, we had a satellite called Arisat-1 that was hand launched from the International Space Station. They took it up on a, on a Soyuz and then the astronauts took it out through the airlock with them and they gave it a shove and were in orbit. <coughs> and I helped do the, the telemetry uh, software for that. We set it up so that any ground station anywhere on the planet that hears <coughs> the telemetry would forward it back to my server and then I would uh, decode the telemetry and th throw it up on a web page. So about once a minute we had the, the, the web page update with the latest telemetry no matter where the satellite is. So if it's over Japan, 
there were three stations in Japan that were, that were always on. And it would be six o'clock here, and it, it would be nine, 10 o'clock in the morning in Japan next day. And you could go look at the web page, and, and once a minute the telemetry would update. And you can watch the, uh, the temperatures change. And there was, there's more stuff I haven't shown here with the solar panels. But you can watch the satellite spin by watching which, sat, which of the solar panels are actually illuminated. Didn't they just get launched in the last two weeks or something like that? That's a different one that they pushed out. Oh, okay. Never mind. They're, they're doing a bunch of them now. Okay. Uh, coming up in the future, the next one that they're going to do is, is Fox 1. It's going to be a little four centimeter, uh, four inch by four inch by four inch cube to be a replacement for AO51. Cool. Magnetically stabilized FM transponder, uh, internal housekeeping unit for the telemetry and command and control, and the uh, science experiment from uh, Penn State to analyze the, the spin rate. Okay. Earth, Moon, Earth, or, or EME communications. Uh, you can kind of think of the moon as a satellite. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the advantage is that, that the moon's up overhead a lot more than, than the satellites are. So you're somewhere on the planet, you send a signal up, and it just passively bounces off the moon and comes back to the Earth, and you can communicate with anybody who happens to be listening uh, at the same time. But the really cool part is that you actually get to hear the speed of light delay for yourself. So if you're doing Morse code, uh, you get your radio set up and you've got your antenna pointed at the moon and you, you hold down the key and you send some, some da's and it goes da, da, da. <coughs> and you hear the, your own echoes coming back several seconds later. So uh, I found this really cool because you used to think of the moon as something that you just observe something that you look at, something that a uh, place that the astronauts went to, but now it's something that you can actually interact with. Uh, if you're not doing Morse code, uh, you can actually run a program uh, written by Dr. Joe Taylor, K1JT. Uh, it's called WSJT, because it's K1JT, because his initials are Joe Taylor. And this will take your sound card and generate a special signal that you can send to your radio so that you don't actually need as much power as if you were running voice or, or CW, and you can bounce the signal off the moon with a lot less power. Um, <coughs> I should mention, it, it, uh, there's a lot of interesting people you can meet in amateur radio, a lot of interesting people that have amateur radio licenses. If you come to the big annual uh, ham fest in, in Dayton, Ohio, you actually get to meet a lot of the people that you talk to on the radio and over the mailing list. Uh, Dr. Joe Taylor is notable because he won the Nobel Prize. So a couple years ago, they, they had an EME convention in Dallas, and uh, Paul Perryworth, WA5WCP, this guy here in the Ron John shirt, brought his uh, EME portable station with him. This, this is a 12-foot dish, and it's on the back of a trailer. Uh, and so this this is the uh, the trail this is the, the camping trailer and this, this is the satellite dish trailer and he goes around from state to state for all the people who are trying to achieve the Wartell States Award for bouncing signals off the moon because there's there's just not that many people interested in bouncing signals off the moon that are in say Montana mm -hmm. so Montana is hard to get if you're doing EME so he put together this mobile station and he would drive up to Montana or North Dakota, and he would uh, talk to people, bounce signals off the moon to communicate with them. And then this is me inside the, so here's, this is the outside of the trailer. This is the inside of the trailer. And he has uh, set up here, there's a radio uh, back here. This is the, the DSP waterfall display that's actually watching about 100 kilohertz of, of bandwidth all at the same time on the waterfall. So if somebody's calling you, but the Doppler shift has moved their signal outside of where your normal receiver would, would hear the signal, then you can still see them visually on here. Uh, there's a, a program up here showing you where the moon is. Back here, there's some switches to move that big dish in azimuth and elevation. And there's a big red switch back here that, that turns the whole thing on and off. 
Uh, when I was there, I, I worked U4CCH, who was actually in the UK. Uh, with this setup, we were running 300 watts on 1296 to a 12 foot dish. And G4CCH is running about the same amount on his end. As a closing thought, uh, in both of these hobbies, we receive electromagnetic emissions with some parabolic shaped reflector. In amateur radio, it's a, it's a potentially a parabolic dish. In astronomy, it's a parabolic reflector. In amateur radio, we're just doing stuff in the radio signals. In astronomy, we're doing stuff with light signals. <laughs> we do stuff with sound, we do stuff with light. Uh, like the, the uh, 100 kilohertz display, we do FFTs of the received audio, looking for signals. And in astronomy, we don't do FFTs, but we'll spread the spectrum out through a prism or, or whatever to look at the whole spectrum. Build the wrong radio antenna. So Dave would probably agree with me that these are the same hobby, just a different wavelength. <laughs> Questions? Everybody's too tired for questions. <laughs> I got links. If you think of more questions, come see me. Uh, to, to, to get something off at the early part, yes, uh, uh, FRAS, that's David Moody, FRAS now, Fellow, Royal Astronomical Society, and just to answer a few questions about that, uh, either sir or your lordship is perfectly acceptable. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not really crazy about your night ship. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, uh, it's, it, it, it's not a, a patent of royalty exactly. Um, Andy pointed out to me that I cannot be a pirate anymore, and that makes me sad. Because <laughs> I am affiliated now with the Empire. <laughs> I'm going to start breathing funny here in just a second. And um, yeah, so I do have the initials after the last name. Questions, common questions I've gotten. Uh, a tattoo, yes, the Herschelian telescope, right here, baby. Uh, secret handshake, uh, there is a secret handshake. I can't tell you because it's secret. secret. Yes, so just don't ask me anymore. I'm tired of that question. And uh, quite honestly, I sometimes look at this and I think they must have gotten me confused with some other David Moody because <laughs> I think I'm in the wrong company of people there. There's uh, some awfully smart people there, but it's uh, um, it's kind of cool. If you're ever going to London, let me know. I'll take you there. It's got a great library. And some of y'all have seen the, uh, I think I've shown you some of the pictures. Some people, if you've been to BAM after, uh, BAM, BAM sick, thanks, yeah. Yeah, beverages after the meeting, I've shown you some pictures of some of the stuff there and it's, uh, yeah, the, their library is absolutely amazing. <clears throat> We're going to talk a little bit about radio real real quickly. What some of you all may or may not know is that I go out to 3RF, the uh, Comanche Springs Astronomy Campus, and I do a lot of astronomy. But if it's cloudy or if it's during the daytime, a lot of people also know that I set my, am my amateur radio station there. And so I run portable amateur radio there. And uh, Hugh's been out there with me, and uh, uh, who else is good? Billy, have you seen me want to put something I've ready to go put? Kelly has, I know, yeah. And, uh, oh yeah, yeah, well, Dougie, of course. Um, he's, Doug and I have done a lot of radio stuff together, so. What I have set up here, this big thing that everybody's trying to duck and get out of the way, <laughs> this is a shortened version of what I actually set up out at 3RF, and this is a, you know, this is a high frequency antenna. It's, it's a uh, it's kind of crinkled right now because it's been in it's been in the bag. Uh, when I straighten this out, it it turns into a, what we call a fan dipole antenna, and I can uh, transmit over all sorts of different frequencies with it in what we call the HF region, which means that's the region that we use to communicate long distance, basically. And so this is, these are for longer distances. I can go hundreds of miles, perhaps thousands of miles from 3RF, uh, from the Comanche Springs Astronomy Campus, which has just an amazing ground plane out there. I've used this antenna and a couple of other antennas, in fact, some very modest, small antennas, 
you know, I've contacted uh, Japan, uh, you, Scotland, Scotland. Uh, have you from Japan yet? No, I have not. No, and uh, uh, and and South America and Australia and a few other places. So, and and I've been using some fairly modest equipment. I mean, y'all. Um, how many watts do you think we're operating at here very often? 100. 100 watts, okay. Anyone else? 50. 50. Yeah, these little, uh, these little HTs, and this, we call this an HT, a handy talkie. Uh, this runs anywhere from like a tenth of a watt to five watts, right? This radio right here is a five watt radio. Actually, I, I, was, in, I was in Australia and I communicated up to Russia using this PSK31 modem on this little five watt radio using this little, what we call magnetic loop inductance antenna. And the reason I did this, used that kind of rig, is because I could fit this into my backpack and take it on the plane to Australia and not get too many questions from the customs officials. <laughs> But it all fit, if you saw me assembling this together, it, it all kind of fit together. So you can operate with a lot of power. It could be 100 watts. It could be up to 1,500 watts. Amateur radio operators can operate a lot of power, but we don't have to. In fact, by law, we're not supposed to operate more than we need to. And that's the way the law, the regulations say. Operate up to the point that you need to operate. So. This is, uh, uh, and so I'm kind of rambling a little bit. I actually have an outline and I'm sort of vaguely moving through here. So this is, a, this is a, one of the radio antennas I use for this and I actually fit this. I have several other links that I drive this up several, quite a few feet up and I fit with guy lines because, well, it gets really windy out there, but this thing has uh, stood up in uh, 50 mile per hour winds. Does great and we've had a lot of fun trying for, yes. There are people who seriously pitch their tent under this antenna. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah I, we couldn't believe it. Yeah, we couldn't believe it, yeah. This is not a safe antenna to pitch under. We had to tell them <laughs> it's a bad place to pitch yeah. your tent. Uh, so, uh, because I was going to start making their tent glow at night. Yeah, you know. put a radiation hazard. So yeah, it is a bit of a radiation hazard. So we do have to, to abide by certain safe things. Nice thing about the, a, play, a remote place like 3RF is that we have a lot of room out there. So, you know, I put my antenna way out away from everything where I thought no one would put anything. And uh, some campers came in and said, we're just going to put our antenna right here, right by this wiry thing with the big wire coils at the end because it just seems like a smart thing to do. Because that's what they did. <laughs> anyway, I use these antennas like this and uh, we get out to the world or we even, even use little small antennas and they get out pretty well too, some vertical antennas. So it's all about the antennas. We have all sorts of antennas and toys and as Doug will tell you, I love playing with the toys, right? And so I've got... It's all about having fun. It's all about having fun, that's right. So I've got all sorts of different antennas that can plug into my radio. I have a bigger radio too that I take out to three or it does get up to 100 watts. And uh, this is a fun hobby. You know, the, the neat thing is you can operate in so many ways, in so many modes. You saw a bunch of people tonight showing you some of the basics about radio. You saw some people that showed you some of the different ways you can use the radio. You can do digital communications. You can do voice communications. You can do CW or Morse code, which is actually, ironically, still one of the most efficient ways to communicate. And what we're finding now is that even though the code requirements have been taken out of the testing, we're finding more and more people glomming on to Morse code because it gets out further. And even in bad, when you have bad interference, you can hear that Morse code signal coming through and still read it. And that's pretty cool. Uh, this digital uh, communications modes like uh, PSK31 and some of the other modes are taking over too. D-Star is becoming a, a new thing that a lot of uh, repeaters are using. So ham radio is not sitting around just being uh, static. And uh, boy, that's a terrible. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, wait. 
It's a very it's a very active hobby, and also it, we do everything from emergency response services and communications. We support a lot of services in that regard. To uh, interesting things like uh, work with like what uh, the satellite work that uh, Doug is doing. Amateur astronomy, as Doug pointed out, it has a real place in amateur astronomy. In, in two ways. One, in a practical sense, uh, John, you're here. What did you start plugging in a lot of your power distribution setup with? Oh, the, um, the resolution The Anderson power poles, right? Power poles. Uh, Fred Luson, who's a past president of TAS, is, an, is a ham operator as well. And, uh, and, and we use often several different power distribution systems. We use the same kind of power that you, we use in amateur astronomy. And we have some really neat things that work. It's great because they work in the dark, they work in inclement conditions, and you can have single sets of connectors that work across everything. And so we have lessons to learn there between the hobbies. On another level, like Doug pointed out, the science is the same. We're all in the electromagnetic spectrum. The math is the same. We can learn a lot about <coughs> the electromagnetic spectrum in space and how things go on here on the Earth by studying all these er areas. And so there's a lot of cross-pollination in these hobbies. And these hobbies end up being a little bit more consuming for us sometimes, but they are a lot of fun. And I, so if you're interested in getting into this, You've heard a lot of information tonight. You know, don't let it overwhelm you. You've probably heard a lot of letters being spout out, like QRP. You know, what is that? Q, you know, these Q signals. And uh, don't let it overwhelm you. It's actually a lot of it's pretty easy stuff. It's pretty fun stuff. Get beyond the words. Uh, we uh, have a radio, a transmitter. We stick a wire to it, and hope we can get out and call people. I will say a couple of things. One of, the, uh, one of the words uh, you hear often is what when calling, who saw contact, how does it open up? Ellie's, she's on the phone and she's saying what? CQ. CQ, 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 CQ. A lot of people think CQ, what does that mean? It means seek you. I'm seeking you. That's what it really is referring to. That's kind of what we do in astronomy too. We're trying to seek something out there, right? And so, uh, you know, the words may be a little bit easier than we think. The communication is there. I uh, hope you try it out. If you're ever out 3RF and I'm out there or one of the other uh, uh, hams are out there and they have the radio up, uh, go play radio. It's kind of fun. And uh, maybe somebody will be up at Atoka doing the same thing. And take advantage of it. And if you're interested, it's easy to get your ticket. We have a lot of people who are, who are good at it. And, uh, I think my time is way over. So listen, thanks a lot, and uh, thanks for coming tonight.